There's a few different ways that genetic diseases can be inherited. Autosomal dominant phenotypes occur when at least one copy of the allele that corresponds to that phenotype is present. Therefore, this can occur in many successive generations, and affects both males and females equally. The really nasty autosomal dominant diseases typically only present later in life, after puberty. Can you think of why this might be? If they presented earlier, then they would almost never be passed on to future generations, since the individual would die before having offspring and therefore not be able to pass it on. However, if they only present later in life, like Huntington's disease, then they can be passed on. In contrast, autosomal recessive diseases are able to present early in life, but still be passed on via carriers, who have one copy of the gene but no phenotype. That's because the phenotype only presents when both copies of the gene are mutated. To inherit an autosomal recessive disease, both parents have to at least be carriers, and if they're both heterozygous, then their offspring has a 25% chance of getting the disease. If it's a more mild disease, then affected parents can still produce offspring, which would increase the odds of the offspring having the disease. Since most disease alleles are rare in the general population, autosomal recessive diseases are rarely seen in more than one generation at a time, since an individual with the disease is unlikely to produce offspring with another individual who carries the disease, except in the case of incest. Therefore, incest is the only case in which this rule does not apply, and the disease can occur in more than one generation in a row. X-linked recessive diseases are more likely to occur in males than females. That's because males only have one X chromosome, so if it's affected, then they have the disease. Which parent will males inherit the X-linked disease from? That will always be their mother, since they get a Y chromosome from their father. Females need to get two affected copies to fully have the disease, which is very uncommon. Why do I say fully have the disease? Well, as I mentioned earlier, female cells inactivate one copy of the X chromosome randomly in each cell during embryogenesis. So cells that have the X chromosome that carries the disease as their active X will be affected. However, this will be a less severe phenotype than in males, and in some cases isn't even detectable. For example, color blindness is due to an X-linked recessive mutation, but if even half of a female's cells are able to detect color, she will probably never notice that anything's unusual about her vision. X-linked dominant disorders can be inherited from the mother or the father, but all female offspring of an affected male will be affected, since men only have one X to give to their daughter. One example of an X-linked dominant disease is hypophosphatemic rickets, which we'll talk more about later. The last inheritance pattern we'll cover is mitochondrial. Since everyone's mitochondria come from their mother, these can only be passed down through the maternal lineage. Also, all of the offspring of an infected woman will be affected, which you can see here. Examples of these diseases include mitochondrial encephalopathy, myoclonic epilepsy, and Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, which causes degeneration of retinal ganglion cells and axons, ultimately causing loss of central vision. Why might these cells be affected? Well, mitochondrial defects will cause the most problems in cells that require lots of energy, which includes retinal ganglion cells, and particularly active neurons. You may also see ragged red fibers in muscle histology, which are clumps of diseased muscle mitochondria. This is a list of the most commonly tested autosomal dominant diseases. As a review, these are diseases that affect every generation, and an affected patient always has an affected parent. Achondroplasia results from a defect in fibroblast growth factor receptor 3, and occurs more commonly in children born to older fathers. It results in dwarfism, which means the patients will have short limbs, but their head and torso are normal-sized. Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, or ADPKD, results in bilateral enlargement of the kidneys with multiple cysts, which you can see in this image. Patients present with flank pain, hematuria, hypertension, and progressive renal failure. 90% of cases are due to mutation in the PKD1 gene, and this is also associated with polycystic liver disease, berry aneurysms, and mitral valve prolapse. You can remember this gene is found in chromosome 16 because there are 16 letters in polycystic kidney. Familial adenomatous polyposis is when the colon becomes covered with hundreds or thousands of adenomatous polyps. Do you know what adenomatous means? That refers to a benign epithelial tumor which arises from a gland. This occurs after puberty, which, as I mentioned earlier, is the case with many autosomal dominant diseases, and they almost always progress to colon cancer by age 40 if they're not resected. Polyps can be seen in this image. This disease is caused by a deletion or mutation on the APC gene, which is on chromosome 5, which you can remember because there are five letters in the word polyp. Gardner's syndrome, which is described in the GI chapter, is also caused by mutations in the APC gene, but it can be distinguished from familial adenomatous polyposis by the presence of osteomas, or bony growths, on the mandible or the skull. Familial hypercholesterolemia results in elevated LDL due to defective or absent LDL receptor. Not having a functional LDL receptor prevents you from removing LDL from the blood, which means you end up with more LDL stuck in the blood. Since this is dominant, heterozygotes are affected, with a prevalence of about 1 in 500 individuals, and they often have a serum cholesterol over 300. Do you remember what normal cholesterol levels are? That would be between 140 and 250, although anything over 200 is considered borderline high. 
Homozygotes are very rare, but they have a much more severe form of this disease, with cholesterol levels often over 700. This can cause severe atherosclerosis, even at early ages, which can result in myocardial infarctions before the age of 20. Patients also may present with tendinous xanthomas, which are deposits of lipids, which you can see in this image on the hand, although they're most common on the Achilles tendon. Hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia is an inherited disorder of blood vessels which results in telangiectasias, which are dilated blood vessels near the surface of the skin. You can see a few in this image on the tongue. This can also cause recurrent epistaxis, or nosebleeds, skin discolorations, and arteriovenous malformations. Do you remember what these are? There are abnormal connections between veins and arteries, which allow blood to bypass capillaries and go directly from the artery to the vein, and they most commonly occur in the central nervous system. Hereditary spherocytosis results in sphere-shaped erythrocytes due to a defect in spectrin or anchorin. These are both proteins that maintain the structure and integrity of the plasma membrane. If they're mutated, this prevents the normal biconcave shape of red blood cells from forming, and therefore, instead of seeing the normal central pallor, the cells appear uniform in color. These abnormally shaped red blood cells are destroyed in the spleen, resulting in hemolytic anemia, and it's diagnosed by looking for an increased MCHC on lab tests, which is an indication of the concentration of hemoglobin in a given volume of erythrocytes. A splenectomy is curative, because then the spherocytes won't be destroyed and won't cause problems. Huntington's disease is a trinucleotide repeat disease caused by a CAG repeat on chromosome 4. You can use the mnemonic hunting for food to remember this. This disease only affects patients once they reach a certain age, usually between 20 and 50, but in successive generations it often has an earlier age of onset. Do you remember what that's called? Right, anticipation. The major findings of Huntington's disease include depression, progressive dementia, choreiform movements, caudate atrophy, and decreased GABA and acetylcholine in the brain, since they start with the letter CAG, which is the repeat in this disease. The caudate atrophy can be seen in this image as the lack of gray matter around the ventricles. The choreiform movements are the most notorious, and they are unintentional, non-repetitive, rapid jerky movements. In other words, the patient is unable to maintain a sustained posture. Marfan syndrome is a connective tissue disorder which mostly affects the skeleton, heart, and eyes and results from a defect in the fibrillin gene. Findings include tall stature with long extremities and arachnodactyly, which means long tapering fingers and toes, peptic excavatum, which means a concave chest, and hyperextensible joints. These patients are also more likely to get cystic medial necrosis of the aorta, which can cause aortic incompetence, a floppy mitral valve, and aortic dissection, which is bleeding into the wall of the aorta. Patients with Marfan's are also more likely to get berry aneurysms, can you think of where berry aneurysms are most commonly found? That would be the circle of Willis in the brain. The multiple endocrine neoplasias include type 1, 2A, and 2B. These will be discussed in more depth in the endocrine chapter, but for now, just know that they are tumors of endocrine glands such as the pancreas, parathyroid, pituitary, thyroid, and adrenal medulla. You should also know that types 2A and 2B can be caused by mutations in the RET gene. Neurofibromatosis type 1, also known as von Recklinghausen's disease, is a neurocutaneous disorder caused by defect in the long arm of chromosome 17. Conveniently, there are 17 letters in the words von Recklinghausen, which can help you remember this. Findings in this disease include cafe au lait spots, neural tumors, such as optic gliomas, Lisch nodules, and scoliosis. The Lisch nodules are pigmented iris hamartomas, which you can see here. Patients with neurofibromatosis type 1 are also more likely to get Wilms tumors, which are kidney tumors that most commonly occur in children. Neurofibromatosis type 2 is caused by a defect in the NF2 gene, which is on chromosome 22. Again, this is convenient for memory, since 22 is just two twos. One of the most common and important findings in these patients is hearing loss, which is caused by bilateral acoustic schwannomas. Acoustic schwannomas are tumors of the myelin surrounding the 8th cranial nerve, which is required for hearing, and you can see an example in this image. These patients can also get cataracts at a very young age. Tuberous sclerosis is a neurocutaneous disorder with incomplete penetrance and variable presentation. It's very rare, occurring in only about 1 in 10,000 people. Findings include facial lesions, called adenoma sebaceum, hypopigmented ash leaf spots on the skin, cortical and retinal hamartomas, seizures, mental retardation, renal cysts, renal angiomyolipomas, cardiac rhabdomyomas, and a higher incidence of astrocytomas. The giveaway on exams is usually the ash leaf spots, since these are the most specific for tuberous sclerosis. They're a few centimeters long and look kind of like this. The last autosomal dominant disease I'll cover is von Hippel-Lindau disease. This is also a neurocutaneous disorder and is caused by deletion of the VHL tumor suppressor gene on chromosome 3, which you can remember because there are three words in von Hippel-Lindau. VHL normally works as part of the ubiquitin ligase machinery, adding ubiquitin to proteins to target them for degradation in the proteasome. When VHL is deleted, or mutated, its targets remain functional. 
The most important target in this disease is HIF, or hypoxia inducible factor. As his name suggests, HIF is induced by hypoxia. What do you think a tissue might want to do as a response to hypoxia? It makes new blood vessels to supply oxygen, which is called angiogenesis. If this happens in an uncontrolled manner, which is what's happening in von Hippel-Lindau disease, it leads to benign tumors of the blood vessels called hemangioblastomas, which most commonly are found in the retina, cerebellum, and medulla. They can also cause bilateral renal cell carcinomas and some other tumors. You can see a cerebellar hemangioblastoma in this image.